Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. My name is Delton, and with me today, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Howdy. Even though you weren't yellow player very often. Oh, man, I was up against two other yellow players all BGG Con. I was so sad, but it was a sacrifice I was willing to make because of my friends. We just got back from BGG Con 2021, uh, beginning of this week. This is episode 106, I should say. Uh, our podcast, Maltest Games Podcast, is all about board games, tabletop games, role-playing games, dice games, card games, all kinds of things of that sort, and generally beer. Uh, but with us today, what we're drinking is something we picked up at BGG Con 2021, which is a coffee brewed in-house in Houston. It is from Many Worlds Tavern. We sat and talked to the guys at Many Worlds Tavern, and by looking at the business cards, it, it was Chris and Andrew. They were both very nice, but Mini World's Tavern is all about having coffee for game nights or game days, anything like that. Plus, it has kitties. It's very, very neat. It does have kitties and very cool artwork. Uh, this is the Homely House Comfort Blend. I would say this is a medium to dark roast blend, mo- probably more on the medium side. I think it's more on the medium side. It's very acidic. I wouldn't call it dark myself because I associate mm-hmm. dark with more caramel, yeah. chocolate. And I wouldn't say this is super acidic. I say it's. It has acidity, but being that it's a blend, it's balanced well. So it's not like a Malawi single origin that's punching you with acidity. It's toned back a bit. It's really good. I I consider this like an afternoon coffee. Like in the morning, I want my coffee to be black as tar. And I want it to be, uh, I want it to punch my face and wake me up. And this is like a gentle, oh, here's a little, here's a little bit of energy for you. Here you go. Have a sip. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Uh, the owners were uh, the owner, I believe, was the aunt was Andrew. Chris, I think, was the barista who was helping him out that day. I think so. But they were very nice. Uh, we sat and talked to them for a little bit. Got some good beer reviews. They uh, referred us to a brewery that specializes in sour ales in South Texas, and we got to talk to them. They also gave us a sample of their uh, instant coffee. Yes. Which was actually really good, especially for an instant coffee. Normally when I have instant coffee, I'm like, uh, it's going to taste like trash. But I'm used to instant coffee because I take my folders with me when we go like, to Cabin Con. I yep. take it so I can just put it in some hot water, be good to go. But this was actually really good. Yeah, it was good instant coffee, which I still think instant coffee is below normal coffee. I think everybody kind of agrees. However, uh, this was the best instant coffee I had. And I think it's great because they're targeting themselves toward tabletop gamers and the convention season is the hardest time to get coffee. So if you have a good instant coffee, you just run some hot water through the Keurig machine or whatever, and boom, you've got a cup of coffee. And I did. And they were super nice. And I got some cat stickers from them. It was good coffee. So I really recommend it because you can order it online, too. We looked it up. Yes, manyworldstavern.com. You can also find it on social media. I do like, by the way, that this bag that they put their coffee in. Uh, is made from 60% biodegradable and 60% renewable material. So there is overlap between those two materials. I don't know what the rest is, but it says, for composting information, transport yourself to their website. That's awesome. So that's pretty cool. Uh, On the back, they have a quote from J.R.R. Tolkien. But yeah, so very cool. Good coffee. We like it a lot. Uh, But that's what we're drinking this episode. But yes, we just got back from BGG Con 2021. An amazing convention experience. And I'm very, very glad that we were able to and chose to go this year. Same here. We roomed with two of our very good friends, Tyler and Alan. Hi, Tyler. Hi, Alan. Speaking of Tyler and Alan, I want to shout out real quick our Patreon patrons. Thank you, Allison, Alan, Jesse, Catherine, Jennifer, and Cliff. And I'm going to go ahead and throw Tyler in there. He's not at the level to get shout outs on the podcast, but it was so nice seeing him and hanging out and literally spending every waking moment with those two. Uh, It was very, very fun. Oh, my God. It was so much fun. Rooming with both of them was an adventure. First of all, first night we got there, Alan's like, we're going to walk to the restaurant, which ended up being like a 40-minute walk under a tunnel in Dallas along a highway. Yeah. But we made it there and back in one piece and had some delicious food at Spiral. And Tyler and I, the whole time, uh, got to talk about books and movies, and he gave me some excellent book recommendations I'm going to add to my Christmas list, Delton. Nice. And then me and uh, Alan were leading the pack, talking about games and content and podcasting and all kinds of ideas and things like that. So it was a very good walk to start the night off at Spiral Diner. Uh, That was the night that we met with Ace and Isaac, right? Yes, it was our first of three visits to Spiral over the weekend. Alan and Tyler had went to Spiral Wednesday. We all went Thursday. We went again Friday. And then Haley and I went Sunday in Fort Worth with our good friend Jesse, which I shouted out Jesse and Catherine. I got to see Jesse in person for the first time since 
2017? Maybe. 18? It's, it's been, been like, like three years at least. Because we went and stayed with them and hung out. And uh, it was really nice to see Jesse. We haven't seen him in forever. He's still the same Jesse, which is always great to see because he's a good guy. And I'm very glad we got to sit and visit. Me too. Because we ate. Oh, Spiral's so good. Spiral Diner is a vegan only comfort food, diner style food. Sandwiches, uh, BLTs, clubs. Uh, they've got nachos, pancakes, all kinds of stuff. It's very good. But we got to do that at BGG Con. We got to take the train there and back. The train trip, as always, is a joy, especially when you get to sleep two hours coming back, waking yourself up snoring and then farting loudly and hoping no one heard, <laughs> which is how I woke myself up one of the times. And I got to write an article on the train like I was in the 1800s and working for a quarter a week to pay for my whiskey and bread. Oh, we uh, also got to go to Madness Comics and Games with Isaac after we got done playing games at Isaac's house. Yeah, it was so nice to see Isaac. So uh, Isaac, we've, we've got to know over the last few years. Uh, so Isaac Vega, he's the fellow who made Starship Shamurai, uh, made Dead of Winter. But I remember Delton and I were talking about the first time we met Isaac. And it was at Gen Con 2017, is that yeah, right? Yeah, Gen Con 50. And like we both had the pep talk each other, go up and talk to him like, who? We want to go say hi. He's there. It's Isaac Vega. I, I want to buy his new game. Oh, my God. Is he going to talk to us? We go up there. Nicest guy ever. Oh, he's an absolute angel. He is the sweetest guy ever. And so over the years um, through Alan and seeing him at multiple cons, we've got to become friends with him. And we're very grateful for his friendship and his hospitality. For sure. And letting us come play games with him and his and it's sweetie. We got to go to, he took us to a place called uh, D-Vegan or D-Vegan. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a D apostrophe vegan. And it was an American Asian style food vegan place over by, was it, did it was the supermarket called Hong Kong Market? Hong Kong Market, yes. Uh, in, I think it's up around Plano in Dallas. And it was a neat market itself. We went and bought snacks because of course. And then the little area we went to the restaurant was these little restaurants of different styles of food. And they had one of them had, you know, ducks hanging and they just all the food looked and smelled so good. And the vegan place was very good. I really liked it. I'm glad that we went and tried something new because we had a lot of spiral and I needed a break for a second. <laughs> we got Cineholic Before as well. we got spiral the next day again. Exactly. Like I needed one meal in between that wasn't spiral. Yeah. So this weekend was a lot of fun. Congratulations again it to was. to Alan and Sean for their amazing Kickstarter success. Yes, I believe that you will still have a couple days. I think the first is the last day of the Kickstarter. Alan and Sean, Tuesday Night Games, have their Mothership Kickstarter for the box set and the deluxe box set, which I backed. And then they have a special get everything with a t-shirt and all level as well. Uh, they broke $1 million on Kickstarter, which is a huge freaking deal, especially for arguably now probably the most successful indie RPG that they created and published themselves. It's amazing. It's phenomenal. They're doing so well with it. And so a big congrats to them. I highly recommend checking it out. They have streamlined the game from what they're calling, uh, I think, version zero to this first edition here. Uh, streamlined it, made some changes to make it more accessible, more easy for new players. And with the higher stretch goals, uh, on TKTV on Tuesday nights, they're doing live plays and they've unlocked a beginner scenario that is basically a book that will come with everything that you can run first time players through to get a feel for the game. And it's the easiest accessibility point for it. So very excited for them. I'm excited to get it when it hits next year. Uh, check it out before it's gone on November 1st. I think something that was really awesome this weekend is catching up with everyone from what's happening over the last two years. Like, for sure. Like, I'm really, really proud of Alan and Sean for their amazing Kickstarter. Really happy to see Isaac proud of him and excited for him and Rose Gauntlet, uh, him and uh, Lindsay's new board game company. Definitely, because Keystone did really well on Kickstarter, and they had a prototype copy I didn't open, but I saw the box that looked good. And they've got so much in the works. It's super exciting. Yeah. And then our friend Tyler, too. He's been busy mm -hmm. designing his own games over the last few years. We've got to play a couple of his prototypes over the weekend. Yep. And I really hope that he's able to move forward with those because I, I think that he has some yes. solid, excellent games in the works. And I'm, I'm happy for the future for him. Definitely. That was one of the neat things was hanging out with our friends, catching up, seeing their prototypes, seeing what they have in mind, where they're going, where they came from. And something that I felt like, and I posted a tweet about gaming burnout. I posted a thread of where I've been in the past two years because I've talked about it here where I say, ah, we played this game. It's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, you know, I had some issues with gaming burnout, wanting to play games. 
And I, it was nice coming to BGG Con and feeling like everyone was coming back. Yeah. Alan and them have been working. Isaac's been working. Tyler's been working. Everyone has been moving forward. And I feel like the beginning of the pandemic, that fell off for a lot of people. And I don't know their individual scenarios. I didn't ask uh, in terms of that and how they felt during that. But it felt like it was back. Everyone was back. The world was starting to return in terms of productivity. And yes, we had to have masks on. And yes, we were happy to comply, happy to be vaccinated, to take precautions, to hand sanitize the hell out of everything. But it was so nice to adapt within those circumstances and see a resemblance of re- like normalcy. And it was so nice to be at BGGCon again and kind of have uh, everything revitalized a little bit. And uh, I came back personally, uh, if you read my tweet, uh, feeling much better about the hobby, the reason we started the podcast and ready to like move forward with, I want to play some freaking games. I want to talk about games. I want to do that kind of stuff. So here we are talking about games. Absolutely. And we came back even with a game day scheduled too. Like we're going to meet up with John and Lainey finally. Because yep. we finally got to weeks. play a game with John a little. He sat down to play uh, uh horrified American Monsters version. So here's here's my my goal from now on at BGG Con. We have to get John to play a game the first day of BGG Con. Oh, God, the hardest day to get someone to play that's working? Okay, at least second day. At least second day, okay. we have to get John to play the board game. Because it was Saturday night at like 9 o'clock, and I saw him over talk, talking to uh, some friends or some other BGG workers. And I go say, hey, do you want to play a game? And he says, yes. And it was his first game of the con. Oh, my goodness, Saturday he, night. Yep, they he, work the whole time. Which John is basically like the Kyle Kinane of uh, BGG Con. He's the voice of BGG Con. Like basically anytime someone makes an announcement, it's John. Yeah. And he and Lainey work very hard with BGG Con to make sure it runs smoothly. And they are awesome people. So we're really excited to be able to have game night scheduled with them in December. Yeah, we get to see their game room. But by God, I'm going to make it my mission to play a game with John within the first Maybe 24 hours. 24 hours. Well, that- B- well, BGG 2022, we can do that. Yes, even if we have to kidnap him. Exactly. Lanny, too. Dang it. Well, talk, speaking of playing games, let's dive into the game section of this episode and talk about what we played. Oh, here's the door. Uh, uh. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So, BGG Con, uh, we played a lot of games, y'all. Um, now, given this isn't a lot compared to a lot of other people. But for us, in the past two years, and in terms of busy scheduling, we played a lot of games. But more importantly, we had fun spending time with friends. And honestly, spending time with friends is the number one of BGG Con. Games are just a way to facilitate more times with more friends. That's kind of how you have to view it, at least for us. So I'm just going to start on the list. Let me find Thursday. Aha. Uh, I'm going to start this list. Uh, and just kind of talk about the games we played. So the first thing we played is an old Reiner Knizia game called Cat Blues. That was my game I picked out, if you hadn't guessed. If you couldn't guess based on the name Cat Blues, uh, it is a game where you play cats who are jazz players, and you're trying to make a quartet. You do so by bidding on sets of cards. You basically lay out cards until you get duplicates or a joker. You then bid how many cards out of your hand, whether you bid one card, two different cards, two cards of the same type, three cards of the same type, whatever. And you slowly uh, cultivate a hand until you can make a quartet. And if you use any of the jokers, they're bad musicians. And the first or the player with the most jokers loses five points at the end of the game. Uh, It's a really neat little interesting drafting game. I don't think it's anything super crazy, but I had fun playing it. Uh, The coloring I wasn't a fan of, especially on the green card. It was very poop. It was from 1998. It's an old game. It could use a facelift. Uh, but it was pretty fun. That wasn't anything too crazy to write home about. Excuse me. You heard me. It was a kitty game. We right then got to show Tyler the magnificentness of Escape, the Curse of the Temple. That game, we absolutely love. We have it on our shelf. We have the big box. It was nice to let Tyler experience the uh, uh, anxiety-inducing <laughs> yes. timer of that game. And the fact when you get stuck and all your dice roll the black, you know, lockdown mask and you're like, somebody come help. And you're just stuck back there. Did we beat it? 
Yes, we did. Like, we had a few seconds left is all. Yeah, it was really close. But we beat it for his first time through and our first time in a while playing the base game. Which I think we covered this in one of our very first episodes of the podcast. We We have, because we covered this and other real-time games. And I talked about how this is my favorite real-time game. Yes, very good. And it still is good. And a lot of these games, uh, instead of playing in the hall, we did play a little bit in the hall. And like I said, we went to Isaac's house one day. But we mostly played in the living room. Or not the living room, the floor hotel of the room. hotel room. Because the thing is, uh, the BGG Con, the way they did it to make sure people were comfortable, the main hall that normally is just the big main hall, it held the very small exhibitor or vendor section. And then that was the mask required hall, where you had to have a mask in all public areas and in that hall, as well as the hot games room and some other rooms. Then downstairs, there was one really big gaming room that was the vendor hall last year. That was a mask optional. That one was very busy, and we stepped in the door, took a real short video of the whole room being so busy, and then left and never came back. <laughs> it <laughs> and, uh, and it like, was our comfort. Yeah, BGG, like they, they, were, they made a statement they were requiring or encouraging vaccines, so I'm sure a lot of folks in there were vaccinated and motivated. Definitely. But I think our anxiety was a little too high for that. So It was, and the main game room with the mask required was sparse. I mean, there were, I'm going to say... It was never even half full at its busiest because the people who wanted to play in there, they played and spaced out. A bunch of other people went to the mask optional. It's like, that's fine. I'm going to stay up here with my mask on or we're going to go up to the hotel room, which is 90% of where we spent our time. Uh, after playing Escape Curse of the Temple, we played Bag of Butts. <laughs> bag of Butts <laughs> is a really interesting little game where you pull some butts out of a bag. Uh, you can basically make three rows of butts the first run you're like all right this is gonna be four you pull out four butts you say all right this one's gonna be six you're gonna pull out six butts the rest go in the third row and you pick a row to keep and the row that you keep is going to give points to the uh, any players based on the butt color then you put a special tile into that bag and the next player uh, will basically draw and the special tiles can mean like you can't draft this one or if you draft this one you get to go again uh, there was plenty of put it in the butt mistakes by Tyler, which were the, was the funniest thing in the world. Lots of chances for a slip of the tongue in that game. Yes, lots of chances to to talk about butts, and it was a, it was a fun, cute, simple game. Very easy to hit the table. One that I'm thinking about picking up. Uh, that was all on Thursday. We didn't I, play I, a lot Thursday. I just want to say I still think they should call that game grab ass. It would be funny if bag. it was grab ass, but it would be less family friendly than bag of butts. It's a bag of butts after dark. Grab ass. There you go. Uh, then on Friday, we played three rounds of Scapegoat. It's a hidden roll game kind of game from Indie Boards and Cards. And essentially, you all play goats, and one of you is going to take the fall for a crime, and the rest of you are trying to vote for the same person. However, the person who's being voted on doesn't know that they're being voted on. They think the target is somebody else. So you have to look at the table, what cards are being picked up and placed down, and try to notice if your cards are missing to where you might be the scapegoat that people are trying to target. Uh, it was a really interesting game. I want to play it again because yes. I enjoyed it. I enjoy social deduction games where talking is not how you solve it. It's by the mechanics. And that's because I'm a bad talker and bad liar. So You just want to play it again because you're tired of being the scapegoat. I was the scapegoat. Did you say escape goat? I did say escape goat. Scapegoat. <laughs> scapegoat. Uh, we also that day played Dale of Merchants Collection Box, which is like an expansion box. Uh, Tyler and Alan weren't real high on Dale of Merchants, especially Alan. Uh, but I really enjoy the game. I want to sit down and play the base game um, and play it a little bit more to kind of see if my opinion, like, because they brought an idea of this is why I don't like it. And I think that might be valid, but I want to play it more to determine if that is valid or not. But Dale of Merchants is a deck building game with cute animals with different abilities where you're taking cards out of your deck to progress toward the end game. So if you progress too quickly, your deck becomes really bad and it makes it hard to purchase new cards to get what you need. I think it's a neat game. We also got to play Hero Quest, the new print, which is a classic dungeon crawler. A lot of people's intro to the game. Probably one of my least favorite styles of board games. (laughs) It was fine. It was Um, fine. I think it lives on nostalgia, which is fine. Yes. If you okay. really enjoy Hero Quest, you know, there's no problems there. It's just not my style of game. I'm glad we got to play it finally because I've always yeah. heard of it. And like, I feel like I came into the board game hobby a little late. One, because I was born in 1991. Yep. And two, uh, because they're so, the board game revolution had like exploded by the time I got into the board game hobby. It did, yeah. And so I never really got the chance to play Hero Quest. And also, I feel like it's very expensive to get your hands on a copy. 
But oh, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that I finally got to play it. Now I know what it's like. Now I know how it's probably influenced other games that have come. I don't really want to play it again. <laughs> I think the neatest thing about it is that it's always the same board, but the map, depending on what rooms are open, what walls are blocked off, changes scenario to scenario. So that's kind of a cool usage. Yes, I can see why so many people liked that, because it's like you don't need new tiles. You don't need new this. You just put a little thing here, and boom, that hallway is now blocked off. You put a doorway here, boom, There's now uh, that's now got a room you can go into. So that's kind of neat. Uh, we played a really neat and gorgeous trick-taking style game called Shamans. Oh, that was wonderful. And I also figured out Tyler's tell in that. And I, you did. I will not disclose it on a podcast. There you go. In case it becomes a famous poker player. Right. I am also not a fan of trick-taking games, but I have found several that I like. I always talk about how much I enjoyed the crew. Well, we played Shamans, which is a trick-taking game that where somebody is the bad guy. And it's really interesting how it works. Basically, there are different suits of cards, and if somebody doesn't follow the lead card, so you know in a trick-taking game, if I play, a, like, let's use a regular deck, if I play a card that's hearts, someone has no hearts, they have to play something else. Well, if you play something else, let's say in that uh, scenario, a spade, then the little token moves toward the bad guy winning. So you have to, based on what people are playing, you have to manipulate which cards you play or be like, oh, I don't have this card. So you play something different, faking it to allow that to progress down. It's a very interesting idea. I really enjoyed it. And the game is gorgeous. That one was neat. I think that one might have been one of my favorites we've played this week. I do want to pick that one up. I think I that one too. would be one that would be an easy play with a lot of people. It has a lot of great tattoo ideas, too. It really does. <laughs> uh, we also played Not Alone, which Tyler ran us through. Not Alone is an interesting card game where uh, one player plays the alien, the, uh, the planet. The other players are people who landed on that planet, and they're trying to escape before the planet absorbs them and assimilates them into its you know, bi biology, I guess. Uh, essentially, you all have the same hand of cards. Those cards do different things. And the monster's trying to catch you at different locations. If you play the two, that means you're going to the two location. He can try to block you there. Uh, it's an interesting game. It feels a little old, but I do think that it holds up in that style because that's not a very common style. Like, I feel like it was, it was pretty unique. And I know there's a lot of expansions, so it's definitely still got legs. Uh, we played, at least me and Haley and Tyler played Metro X. Metro X is possibly one of my favorite rolling rights now, even though I don't have it, a flip and fill. Uh, essentially, you're filling out train stations. You follow the line, write down a number, or sorry, you follow the line, marking X's, different train stations overlap. It's very simple, but it's very thinky. And then we also played that at DeVegan when we went to dinner the next day. We brought that and played it at the table. We did, because Alan's trying to find a rolling right for his wife that she'll like, and I said, Metro X is my favorite because it's so simple to understand. It plays in 15 minutes. And I just like it a lot. We also played Nice Buns. This one, oh my gosh, it was so much fun. It is so cute. I mm -hmm. want this one. I know, it's adorable. Essentially, it's steamed buns, so bow or bowsy. Um, you are rolling three dice, determining uh, two stacks of those dice, whether it's the small and there's a small dice, big dice, and medium dice. You split those into two different piles, whether it's zero and three, two and one, one and two, and your opponent picks which one they want to use, you get to keep the other, and then you resolve the actions, which is putting buns on your, you know, in front of your plate, swapping buns with other people, giving somebody your stinky fish head buns, and it's super cute, super light from Big Potato Games, and very fun. Uh, we also played Camel Up, which is just a classic racing game. Uh, I guess it's more of a betting game. Like, you're betting on camel racing, but the interesting thing is, if a camel lands on the same space as another camel, it sits on top of it. So if that other camel moves, it's carrying it with it, and the one on top is considered in the lead. So it's a very weird mechanic. We also played an updated version of it, so also had a couple of camels that moved backwards, which could yes. totally throw a wrench in things. Yeah, the new version of Camel Up is highly recommended over the old. Not only is the little dice pyramid better, but those white and black camel was kind of a neat idea. Uh, we played a game called Scout, which was that... Um, shoot, what was it called? Uh, it's an oink game that Tyler picked out of the library, and I really liked it. Essentially, you had a hand of cards you couldn't organize, and you were trying to find uh, pairs or runs or things like that. So someone would play like, all right, I got two twos, and the next player in line could say, okay, I'm going to play a two, three, four, five, because it's more cards. And then they would take the old player's hand and flip it upside down. Then if you couldn't take those cards, you would pick one from either end to put anywhere in your hand, 
and that would allow you to then build bigger runs of cards or whatever and get more points that way. Uh, because anytime somebody took a card because they couldn't beat your hand, you still get points. Really interesting mechanics. I liked it a lot. It's one that I would like to pick up. Same here. I think it's very simple. Easy game, simple game. If you played Skip Bow, you can play this. Exactly. Uh, we played, as I said, Horrified American Monsters. I love the Horrified system. I think it's such a great entry to cooperative games. Uh, the Horrified American Monsters is much brighter, more colorful, and I think aesthetically looks a little better. Uh, but the monsters were, uh, they were tough for us. We played with a group of five. Yes. And I feel like we just played quickly without discussing too many options of swapping items and things. Uh, but I want to play it again. I did like it. Yeah. And if you are interested in Horrified, we reviewed the regular Horrified on episode 103. And so if you'd like to learn a bit more about that, at least the non-American, what would you call it, the classic monsters version? It's Universal Monsters. Universal Monsters version. Yeah. yeah. Then check that out. Yeah. Very good game. And then the last one that I have marked down that we played that wasn't pro none of these were prototypes of anybody's because I don't want to get into anything. Uh, Campy Creatures, which is the one we played about more monsters, very comic book style. Everybody has a card that ranges from zero to eight, a hand of cards ranging zero, blah, 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 blah. zero to eight. Zero is the blob. Eight is Kaiju, which is great. And essentially, uh, cards come out on the table and you're going to play cards face down. You flip them at the same time, and the higher values get to take the cards from the table first. So you're trying to get teenagers, or you're trying to get the archaeologist. And it's just a really interesting of, like, what has everyone already played? How can I, if I think they're playing this, I can try to play this card, which has an interruptibility. Uh, I think it was a very neat game. I liked it. No, I really liked that game, and it was one of my favorites that we played. But you forgot a game that we played, Delton. I did? You did. What did I miss? Taboo. We did play three hours of Taboo from one to four in the morning. We did. The last night, we, we, I, so I, I spent $5 of Delton's money on, it was Celebrity Taboo from 1991, and we played through 500 of those cards in three hours. Tyler, Alan, Delton, I all took turns giving clues and guessing that. It was a blast and a great night, like chore night to finish BGGCon 2021. Uh, we just goofed around and did that. We went through 500 cards, had a great time, spilt a bunch of pretzels. Alan punched himself in the face, <laughs> doing an elbow drop onto the bed. Uh, I I had a good clue about a, a, a torpedo for the word torpedo. I just, we had a lot of fun that night finishing up with uh, Taboo. Taboo is not a game I normally want to play, but with that group of people just goofing around with nothing else going on, trying to salvage every last second of the con that's what we chose and it was great yeah the next day alan asked each of us you know what was your favorite part of the con and you know of course i i love just seeing everybody but it's moments like that it's you know we're all being goofy we're all playing together it's not a intense game that we're playing that we're using all of our glucose in our brain we're playing freaking taboo but for three hours in a hotel room until four in the morning like like i feel like we're, i was at a sleepover again like whenever i was a little kid and it For was sure. it was just pure joy. It was so much fun. We made a mess. We laughed. Alan got punched in the face. It was wonderful. It was a great time. I just those are and here's the funny part. That's all the games we played. It wasn't that much. Some of those had uh, you know repeats, but uh, we didn't play a ton of games because we we chatted, we caught up, we met new people, we went and ate, we visited, we you know talked about this, we shared funny videos. Like it was, it was more of we hung out with friends and games were on the side, and I loved it. I did. It too. was such a good time. Uh, in terms of all the games, I think out of all of them, the one that I'm still most intrigued and like wanting to play again is probably Shamans. Yes, I think I'm the same way. Shamans was very, very cool. I would like to pick it up. I think I want to pick up Campy Creatures and Nice Buns and maybe Bag of Butts. Nice Buns for sure. Yeah. So those are those are the biggest ones out of that list. But we also didn't get to try a whole lot. They had a whole hot games room with uh, Boone Lake, the new Alexander Pfister game that we didn't get to test. And uh, that new game, uh, uh, Gutenberg, based on the Gutenberg press. And very excited to try that game out. Didn't ever go to the hot games room. We just had a good time. Now, we did do, which I'm going to say is probably was the most uncomfortable time, but also still fun, was the board game bazaar. Yes. Which is one hour of everyone buying board games from people's used board game stacks. And there was a lot of people in a room. 
that was the you know the most uncomfortable, but it was also a shorter time. It cleared out pretty quick, and everybody wore a mask. Everybody was good about masking and you know trying not to get too much in your bubble, even though there were some. But it was a good time, and I bought way too many games. And I bought Taboo. Yeah, she bought Taboo, and I bought everything else in the world. But it was good. I finally got my hands on Sekigahara from GMT and uh, Imperial Struggle from GMT. I got uh, picked up Tokaido. That way I can finally utilize the expansion your sister bought me for my birthday. Hell yeah, brother. So picked up a lot of things. Uh, I picked up another game that I'm going to shout out. I have no idea if it's good or not, but I absolutely adore the artwork of the game. So I picked it up and I'm hoping it's good. But it is called Fate of Phantos, and I believe it's Savage World's Fate of Phantos. It was a Kickstarter several years back, I guess. 2017. 2017, but it's got a very, like, 1970s, 1980s dark fantasy artwork to it, and it's absolutely awesome. I love the look of the game. It's a card-based game. I'm hoping it's good. Even if it's not, it's a bookshelf game because it looks phenomenal to me. But yes, I picked that up as well, and it just looks awesome, but... I mean, that's kind of all the games we played. I guess we did play test some games. We did. Uh, we play tested Static Blood Moon from Adversary Gaming Collective, which is, they, they say they're out of Pensacola. Out of Pensacola. They're looking at kickstarting their game next year. I think it's a really neat idea, and I'm excited to see how it develops and everything by the time Kickstarter gets here. Because that was pretty cool. We played through like one of the three phases of the game to get a feel for it. It's essentially a dice drafting game with an interesting scoring mechanic that makes the drafting a little more interesting too. Plus it looks dope. It looks really cool. I think the look is very neat. Uh, Then we also played a game called Mantle of the Keeper from Strongbox Games. It's also their first game and they're looking to do also bring it to Kickstarter next year. Also some Oklahomans, some Oklahomies, if you will. Yes, they're from, uh, from Tulsa. One of them went to the same school as Haley for college. Go Pokes! And graduated much more recently, so I think they're a little bit younger than we are. I'm old. I turned 30 on Monday. You do turn 30 on Monday. Uh. Ah, happy early birthday. Yeah. But uh, Mental of the Keeper was a skirmish game with uh, dice-based movement for the skirmish board and cards for your actions and defense. Seems like an interesting system. We played just one short turn of it just to kind of get a taste of how it functions. With some cool characters, too. Some awesome representation. I really like the characters. Women. I like that. Female uh, characters. Yep. And the artwork was good as well. So but we got to play test both of those. Uh, so that was really neat. We also got to take a look at Last Light. Uh, it's a game by Roy Canaday. He's a guy who um, edits a lot for the Dice Tower stuff and is you can find him on different Dice Tower videos. Uh, but it's coming out through Gray Fox Games. And it's a really interesting, it's probably my favorite looking game that I saw. It was just pretty with marbles and planets. Yeah, so essentially there's 3D planets. Uh, on this circular board that has two different circular pieces and then a static piece on the table. And essentially, it's what they call a 4X game. And a 4X game, uh, the 4Xs stand for uh, explore, exploit, exterminate, and expand, I think. I have never heard of that in my life, so I'm going to trust you on that. I believe those are the four. Essentially, it's I'm building up, I'm using the resources, I'm exterminating my enemies, and I'm expanding my stuff. It's, it's something like that. Well, most of those games take forever. Always. They always take forever. This one they are touting is actually does play in an hour because that's always the goal. People are like, oh, this plays in an hour. And then two hours later, you're finally done. Uh, but what they did differently in this one that he explained, uh, we talked to Lance, who also known as Undead Viking on Board Game Geek and stuff, been around for a long time doing reviews. We talked to him all about it. And one of the things he said that I think is interesting is normally in those games, you can turtle. You can stay in one spot, build up your army, and then move out when you want. Well, this one, since you're in a solar system around a sun, the solar system's moving. So as you move your pieces toward the center, they will now move away from you every turn. So it's impossible to sit and build up an army, forces you to have interaction, which to me puts the game on a timer, which I like. I think that idea of you can't just sit and build up an army and hope that you can then do something crazy. So I'm excited to see what comes of that one. It's probably also going to be a Kickstarter, I would assume, because that's just how most games get made now. Uh, But it looks really cool, and I'm excited for that as well. Yes. Plus it's pretty. Plus it's pretty. Yeah, so that's it's a lot of games that we got to test and look at, and it was just a it was a game filled but also friend filled weekend. So very great weekend. Definitely. So before we get into the topic of the episode, let's get us another beer. I forgot. I guess a beer. We haven't had beer yet. 
No, this is a mixture of alcoholic and non-alcoholic episode. Normally, it's one or the other. It's the four loco of episodes. Oh, God. Because it's caffeine and alcohol. It's outlawed? Uh, yes. Do they still have four locos, just at lower alcohol content? Yes. It, I think it's lower alcohol and lower caffeine. It's not like a... Yeah. It's not like you're having five espresso shots and a, a liter of Goldschlager anymore. I keep trying to tell people that a vodka Red Bull is not good for you. I have a coworker who loves vodka Red Bull, and from all I've ever understood, that's very hard on your heart. Given I have high blood pressure, so I have to be concerned about such things. You don't have a heart. I won't if I have a vodka Red Bull. <laughs> so, Delty Poo, what are we having today? I know it's from Tups, and Tups is one of my favorite breweries of all time. It's also a Texas brewery, and we just got back from Texas, America. This is from Tups Brewery in Texas. This is full-grown Jack an imperial stout with pumpkin spices. It's a 12 fluid ounce can with a 12.1% alcohol by volume. It says, with the addition of pumpkin spice, this huge, full-flavored imperial stout just grew a little bigger. Crack it open before he takes your head. Oh, God. SRM 50, (laughs) whatever that means. IBUs of 50, so it's pretty balanced and uh, lower on the hop scale. Body, five. Roast, five. Color, five. Bitter, two. Sweet, three. That is my personality right there. Bitter two and sweet three. And body five. So this is, yes, this is black as night, has a nice foamy head on top. You smells can't like see a pumpkin pie, it. which is. You can smell the pumpkin spice, but also the malt. Yes, but it smells like pumpkin pie. That's why, that's why I chose this beer. So we're actually recording this the day before Thanksgiving. Yes. So I thought it'd be a great little, little. Into the fall season, a little pumpkin spice. The pumpkin spice in this is so amazingly complimentary of the beer itself. It's kind of like when we talked about pumpkin head, uh, dogfish heads, pumpkin ale. Yep. Pumpkin Where, ale. Pumpkin ale, yeah. Whenever the, the spice feels like it's brewed with the beer rather than just thrown on top. Because like a lot of the novelty fall beers feel like you have the beer, but they've added like pumpkin flavoring or they've added some pumpkin spice seasoning. But this actually feels like it was brewed with the beer. It's yeah. part of the beer, not added to it. Definitely. It's got a really nice mouthfeel. It's not as heavy as I thought. The texture is heavier than a standard beer, but not as bad as I expected it to be, which is good. But it's a very tasty beer. It ends nicely. It's got a nice amount of carbonation to it. It's very sweet, but the spices are very good. Yes, I love it. That's a really good one. So that's from it's, Tup's Brewery. What's it called? Uh, Full Grown Jack. Full Grown Jack, like Jack O' Lantern. Yeah, this is the one that we had whenever Jen Wynn and Cody came over. Yeah. And I had two beers that night because this was one of them. Yeah, and I can see this being a beer. I mean, at 12%, this half a beer is going to be fine. Yep. Yep. And so the topic of today's episode is pros and cons of COVID. Ish. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So, pros and cons of COVID. Uh, so as you know, COVID's still a thing, turns out. Yep. Uh, it hasn't gone away, turns out. And so BGG, you know, we are really grateful. I know that, you know, in the state of Texas, they can't necessarily mandate everybody have a vaccine but you know bdg did say you know we want you to have a vaccine everyone has to wear a mask in these areas and they did a really good job of enforcing that they did which i I love talking to john so john again john day is he he works with bgg and we we chatted with him after we played the game and he said that you know the con was great he had very few instances where he had to request people to pull up their masks whenever he did they were very uh compliant and they did so and they apologized yeah and i like what he said he said uh board gamers follow rules and you can tell that this weekend <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and so you know we had some initial apprehension about going to bgg con we're not gonna lie like we waxed uh, yeah. sorry we we wavered on it for a little bit we weren't sure if we we're gonna go you know it's still a lot of crowds even though delt and i are both fully vaccinated like it's still kind of nerve-wracking to go to a con it really is. I mean, it was something we weren't going to do. Like, at first I was, no, I'm not going. It's it, it, Things are going to have to change or be a certain way. And, you know, it's it's tough because these are things we want to do. I mean, I go to the local game shop and play Flesh and Blood, and here I'm one of maybe two or three out of 12 people that wear a mask when I play. I don't, I don't take my mask off. I don't take water to drink. I just wear it because, I don't, you know, I'm 
trying to be safe and protect myself and others. And that's where I want to do. I want to keep myself healthy. So I'm going to wear a mask while I'm there. So it's kind of tough because a convention, my idea was no one's going to be listening to the rules. No one's going to, you know, want to follow everything. It's just going to be a pain. But it was one of those things where it kind of took friends and friends' experiences with other cons to really make it good, right? Right. Um, so one of the things that helped convince me was Tyler worked the portal booth at BGG, or I'm sorry, at Gen Con. Oh, he did. He worked at Gen Con, and he said that BGG Con was going to depend on how he felt at and after Gen Con. So he had a good experience at Gen Con, staying, you know, masked up and staying healthy and people following rules and being respectful. And he was happy enough with the way that Gen Con handled it to go to BGG Con, which arguably probably had stricter rules, I would think, or at least close to. And then it also depended upon how many of our friends were going to risk it and go to BGG Con for us to go. Because Alan said, hey, I'm going to BGG Con. Tyler said he's in. We said we were in. And for me, that's good. We also got to see Isaac. We got to see other people. And I mean, that was, you know, a big factor was if our friends are going to go, we will go and have a fun time. If they weren't going to go, I wasn't going to go just for me and you to play games. Right. And then risk it for that. Yeah. And so, you know, and I, I feel like we didn't really, and I could be wrong, but I feel like we didn't really risk a lot. Like we came back, no con crud. True. Which is nice. I might be wearing a mask to cons forever because no con crud. Right. But, you know, BDG did a, such a great job of requiring those masks in those areas and encouraging vaccines and having a, a lower population of folks to attend. And, but the thing is, you know, if you don't feel comfortable going to cons, that's okay. No, 100%. we're saying, we say we felt okay, but you know, Delta and I, we washed our hands, we wore our masks, we disinfected our phones and our things we carried around every day whenever we got back to the hotel. Like we took precautions and we came in knowing that there was a risk, but we also, you know, we're vaccinated. We took precautions. But if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. No, 100%. There are still many different ways for you to enjoy games with others, whether that's online, whether that's video games, or whether that's just playing with your household. You know, so when we talk about going to cons, you know, we had a great time. I'm so glad that we went. But if, it's, if you're not comfortable, that's understandable, and that's okay. We're, you know, we're still going to be probably planning on going to cons next year. We're still going to be taking precautions even if COVID is better. But, I mean, like I said, I didn't get con crud. I haven't had a stomach bug. I haven't had a flu, anything like that. It's been great. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable, no pressure. It's all good. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's something that we, you know, went in understanding is that we are choosing to do this. And here's something that I liked. BGG Con said, we're requiring vaccines. But the thing is, with the Texas law, they could not force you to show your vaccination card. You just had to make a pledge saying, I am vaccinated. I'm going to respect the rules. That sucks. That's Texas. Texas has some bullshit going on in terms of that, where they can't allow private functions even, you know, to, re to truly require a vaccination. But they can force masks, and the hotel also was asking for masks in the lobby, and the attendees were good about it. But something that... I think uh, I really liked, and part of the reason that I decided that we should still go to BGG Con is that as they started releasing these COVID numbers, right, or in turn, not COVID numbers, but the COVID precautions, they started saying, okay, we're limiting the number of attendees max. That's way lower than 2019, which was like 3,500 people. We're lowering that down. The events were drastically cut down because one of my favorite things to do at BGG Con is the pitch card tournament, which is on the first night on Thursday night at BGG. It's this, or maybe it was Wednesday night, but it's a it's pitch car, and I love the pitch car tournament. Well, I wasn't able to do that this year because they didn't have it because it's a bunch of people in a small space, and I understand that. That makes sense. But something I realized when thinking about BGG Con going, okay, I want to get us some press badges. We've never had media badges at a convention. I think this is the, a good first step and all of that. Something I noticed was after they released a lot of the announcements saying we're requiring masks in all of these, we're going to require masks in the vendor hall, we're requiring masks in the main play area, all of the hotel lobby, every public f uh, space requires a mask, but we will have mask optional areas. After that, the number of tickets available went up. The people who were uncomfortable with that, of uh, uh, optionals, or people who uh, didn't feel like attending, 
didn't buy tickets or they refunded their tickets because they thought either A, I don't want to wear a mask, B, I'm still too uncomfortable, or C, they weren't vaccinated and weren't wanting to, you know, fill out the waiver or whatever. Uh, those people dropped their passes, which means less people were attending because of it. So the people who had issues with those precautions, the people who would you know, maybe be the troublesome few, they just didn't go. And so I felt like the, the crowd who was there were doing everything possible to make this happen, to make sure it succeeded, to prove that even in these dire times, even in these unsure, slightly unsafe times for you know uh, things like COVID, we can make it work. We can do what we have to do to still have this little taste of normalcy. So I loved that. And in deciding to go, seeing those badge numbers go up where they had more available, that wasn't them releasing them. That was people canceling, which made me more confident in the decision to go because I wanted less people around, right? If possible, I want a good number because you want to, you want to see friends and stuff but it doesn't have to be crazy. So I think they said the max number, what was it, 1930? I think something like that. 1950. It was less than 2,000 people total the entire weekend, and we were never around. The most we were around was in the bazaar. Aside from that, we really didn't have a lot of people around us. Like, we weren't in a giant, massive room just surrounded by people, aside from the bazaar. So it was it was good. It was comfortable for the most part. The bazaar was the most uncomfortable spot, and it still wasn't bad because everyone had masks on. Everyone was doing their part. And we got no con cred. And we got no con cred. So, it, you know, it's a hard thing, but I'm very glad BGG Con happened. I'm glad they took the necessary precautions. And I think if those precautions are respected and if those precautions are put in place and all of that kind of stuff, I think that the conventions next year are definitely a will do for us. Ditto. Yeah. With that being said, let's move to the question of the episode. And now, join us. For a Malt House Games podcast special, bite size question. So, the question today is very simple. We're a podcast about board games and beer for the most part. Uh, what was our favorite beer of BGG Con 21? So, every time I go to Texas, I try to get at least one can of Revolver's Blood and Honey. It is a simple beer, it is a delicious beer, it's a 7.1% beer, but it is one of my favorites, and I like every time I talk to a Texan about it, like ah, oh, because I, I feel like, and I don't know this, but I feel like Revolver's Blood and Honey is kind of like that generic beer that everyone carries because I do see it everywhere, and so maybe Texans are like, oh, that's just generic, or oh, that's just a uh, fine, but man, I freaking love Revolver's Blood and Honey. That, that was is one a of my beer. favorite. It was a very good beer. I took several drinks of it. And so, what about you, Delty Poo? My favorite. So when we got to Fort Worth and got off the train, we had like an hour and a half to do something until we hopped on to go from Fort Worth into Dallas itself. And so we went to a place called Flying Saucer, and it's a little bar with some food and stuff. So we just got hummus and pita, nice, easy to make vegan. And we each got a beer. Well, I got Real Ale's Devil's Backbone, which is a Belgian style triple at 8.1%. It was a very good triple. I am the first person that will tell you Belgians have the best beer. I'm sorry, Germans. It is Belgian beer. I'm sorry, Mexico. It is Belgian beer. I'm sorry, America. It is Belgian beer. We just lost like 80% yeah. of our fan base. It will forever be <laughs> the Belgian style of beer. I just absolutely love it. Belgian, uh, an Abbey style quad is my all time favorite. Triples are very good. Doubles can be very good, but not my favorite. I, a Belgian wit, a Belgian white, uh, all of it. All of it is very, very good. But this Belgian triple, Devil's Backbone from Real Ale, was very good. I liked it a lot. And so I think that was my favorite beer of the con. We didn't have a ton, though, but that was the winner, for sure. Ditto. With that being said, I think that kind of wraps up everything. I know that we rambled a lot this episode, but hopefully you got to hear about a few different games you hadn't heard of or seen before. And hopefully... Uh, you know, we made you excited for conventions. If you haven't been to a convention, uh, we recommend starting small. BGGCon does have a spring convention that's always smaller than the fall one. It is best to go with friends, and you just get to play games all day and hang out, which is amazing. But even if you don't go with friends, uh, Wednesday night, I believe, they have a uh, meetup for solo folks. Yeah, I so, believe they call them orphans. Yes, so if you're going by yourself, like, there is opportunity to make friends. There are others who yeah. go by themselves. And also what's awesome, I know we've talked about this with cons too, whenever you're playing, there are folks who have signs that say like, uh, they'll say like teachers needed or they'll say players needed. And so you can go and set up your game, put up the sign that says players needed, and you're going to have someone come up and play. Like we did that. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do it this time because we kind of, we played most of the games in the hotel room, but our first BGG con, 
constantly put up the sign, players needed. And so we got to meet so many fun people. Oh, for sure. So it is something you can go to. We always recommend with friends, but you can go alone if you're a type of person that doesn't have an issue with social situations being, you know, not knowing those around you. Uh, BGGCon is a great one, but it's also sometimes hard to get into because everybody likes it. But also look for your local cons. We have Token Con here in Oklahoma City. And Token Con is very small. It's a lot of local people that we recognize and know. But it's a blast to go and just play games and hang out with friends. So we recommend going to conventions. And I think as long as the convention is taking the proper precautions. And you feel safe going. And you feel safe going. Then it is worth, right now, I think it's worth that taste of normalcy. Because I would rather be playing board games with a mask on than not playing with my friends at all. Yes. I think that's what it comes down to, right? Uh, Doing what I have to do and having fun. So definitely make sure to check out some kind of conventions at some point in time. If you feel like waiting until next fall to see where things are, absolutely okay with that. There's plenty of options between, I don't know, there's Origins, BGG in the fall, BGG in the spring. There's Dragon Con. There's PAX Unplugged. There's, uh, shoot, there's all kinds of conventions. Gen Con, of course. There's so many conventions that you can look at, and I'm very hopeful for the future. And motivated. And motivated for the future as well. With that being said, I think that that mostly wraps stuff up. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, if there's a game that you think we need to go pick up or rent and play for the podcast, make sure to send us an email. If you want us to talk about a specific topic that you think we haven't touched on, send us that email. If there's a question that you want us to answer, whether it be our favorite food, the type of shoes we wear, or our favorite color of cat, Send those questions <laughs> to contact at malthousegames.com and I, I will be it. happy to oblige. I can't choose that. What well, favorite color of cat? You can't choose a favorite color of cat? No, because my children are two different colors. Because you have an orange tabby with white and you have a not really calico, but tortoise shell, according to the groomer, but basically calico. Torty calico brown white fluff. Yeah. I just cats are cats. They're all amazing. It's fine. Dogs are dogs. They're all amazing. It's fine. That's where I'm at in life right now. But yes, send us an email. You can find us also on social media at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can find me personally at Delton Brack, D-E-L-T-O-N-B-R-A-C-K. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. I'm going to call that. Oh, go ahead. I'm going to say this is going to release on the eve of my 30s. It is. We're going out for Haley's birthday on Saturday, the 27th. This will release on Sunday the 28th, and her birthday is the 29th. She'll be a big 30, so make sure to go to social media and tell her happy birthday and happy 30th. She's now caught me. 30 flirty and thriving. We're making it. With that being said, I think that wraps everything up. Thank you again for tuning in to the Malthouse Games Podcast, episode 106. Until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye.